All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so what I wanted to talk about here a little bit was, um, you know, I know we just went through a, a major election with, you know, that are going to have incredible ramifications for the country. Uh, Democrats have retaken uh, the presidency, the House and the Senate, um, creating one of those, you know, rare windows when one party can actually pass legislation. Um, but in one sense, no matter what happened in this election, no matter who controlled which uh, branch of Congress or the presidency, uh, the task for the Medicare for All movement is going to be very same, uh, similar uh, this next two years, um, which is that we we have to get much, uh, we have to have far, far more uh, co-sponsors on the bill. We just need far more legislators to, to get behind Medicare for All. Um, and to do that, obviously, we have to organize, we have to be building our power in those districts, uh, building up coalitions, uh, mobilizing activists all over the country. So what I did... Um, just before the elections took place, actually, is I looked a little bit at uh, focusing mostly on Democratic districts and the districts of, you know, independents who are left-leaning, Democratic-leaning, um, comparing some high-level differences between the districts where, that we have already got a co-sponsor on the bill with the districts that we do not have a co-sponsor in the bill. So this is mostly focused on the House, um, and I looked a little bit at the Senate uh, as well. And I was looking at things like, you know, geography um, and then demographic data, you know, like age, uh, race, income levels, um, political affiliation, that sort of stuff. So this is going to be a pretty high level picture. It's not going to get into the weeds of, you know, someone who has a deep, deep understanding of a particular district and what we need to do to win there. Um, but I, I thought there were some interesting takeaways that I just wanted to share with the conference. So I'm calling this the road to, to 218 and 51. That's obviously how many votes we need at a bare minimum in the to win in the House. And then we need 51 votes in the Senate. Uh, we are about halfway there uh, towards 218 in the House. And we are a ways off in the Senate. We have, you know, uh, we're about closer to a fourth uh, the way there. So I'm just going to start with a big picture of the geography of where our current um, co-sponsors are on the House side. Um, and this breaks out the country by regions, and it looks at what percentage of Democratic or, again, independent Democratic-leaning uh, representatives are on the bill in all these different regions. So this is if you live in one of these regions and you want some bragging rights, this is the, <laughs> this is the graph that you're going to look to. Um, and you may not have expected this, but Rocky Mountain region actually has the highest percentage of Democrats organized in the country. So. Big shout out to, uh, to our Rocky Mountain um, organizers. Um, so, and then, you know, close behind is kind of the West Coast, uh, New England region and the, the North uh, Eastern part of the country that um, you, you might expect is the more liberal parts. But, you know, a surprising part, uh, if you look at the Southeastern part of the country, 50% of Democrats are on board the bill in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Arizona. That might not be something you'd expect if you think that there's a stark South-North difference um, in terms of support for Medicare for all within the Democratic Party. Uh, that's not the case, but also uh, the areas of the country where we have the furthest to go are pretty clear here. Um, that's uh, very starkly the, um, the South-Eastern uh, part of the country, which includes quite a few states. Uh, some of that is the Deep South, some is you know uh, Sun Belt area, some is kind of the DC metro area. Um, and as well as the Great Plains states where we have quite a ways to go as well. But uh, what this doesn't tell us obviously is that some of these regions have way, way, way more Democrats whose votes we're gonna need than others. So this next graph, um, instead of looking at the percentage of Democratic reps who are on board Medicare for all in those regions, uh, looks at the share of all of the Democratic reps we have on board the bill right now who are in that region. So you can see that the vast majority, uh, uh, the, the West, uh, sort of the far West states um, have by far the highest uh, share of our total co-sponsors, uh, followed by the, um, the uh, Mid East, uh, Mid East region, kind of a strange term to use for that, you know, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland section of the country. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, obviously, the, the parts of the country that just don't have as much population, don't have as many reps, we have far fewer there. Um, but when we flip this and we look at the opposite, which is uh, looking at the next 118 co-sponsors we need to win to pass the bill through the House, um, where are they? This is a much more interesting and revealing story because this is basically telling us 
where does organizing proportionally have to be happening in the country for Medicare for all in order for us to win this thing? Um, and there's still a long ways to go on the West Coast. 22% uh, of those remaining votes we need to win are on the West Coast. Uh, but there's a ton more organizing that needs to be done, especially in that Southeast region, uh, which in that very first graph we saw, we, we have made very, very little progress and there actually are a lot of democratic reps in that Southeastern part of the country. And we also still have a long ways to go in the middle Eastern part of the country, you know, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware. So um, that's kind of the big high level geographic overview. Um, and then I looked at some other things, like I looked at how contested the districts are, um, where we have reps versus those where we need to win over reps. Um, and um, a pretty stark uh, finding right, right off the bat is if you look at our existing co-sponsors, which is the graph, the pie chart on your left, only five of those districts, those first 114 districts that we have on board the bill, um, are considered swing districts. And this is a pretty broad definition of swing district that you know, there's any conceivable chance in this past in, I think we used it, I used the 2018 election cycle, uh, any chance that they could swing Republican or Democrat, you know, maybe up, up to a 5% chance. Um, so we have very, very few swing districts uh, uh, where the, the rep is on board the Medicare for all bill, only about 4% of our current co-sponsors. But when we look at the next batch of districts that we really have to organize, uh, the Democratic, Democratic leaning districts, we have to win. Uh, 37 of those are swing districts. Um, that's a full third of the upcoming districts that we're going to have to organize and win in. Um, so that's quite a difference. And that's also reflected in this uh, next graph, which looks at just the average margin of victory. Again, if you're looking at the districts where we have uh, co-sponsors on the Medicare for All bill, the average margin of victory is 53.5%. Um, and that's, you know, an average Democratic vote of 75.2%. That might seem insane to you, um, but there's so many districts that are um, so solidly Democratic that uh, often there isn't any Republican challenger. So Democrats are getting 100% of that vote. So it kind of skews these, these average margins a little bit. But when you look at the next uh, 118 districts we have to win in order to pass a bill in the House, the average mar uh, margin victory is about half that. Um, so, you know, the average Democratic vote there is just 63%, which is much closer to 50. And again, these averages are hiding a lot of those swing districts where Democrats are winning by, you know, less than a percent or 1% or 2% or 3%. And the political dynamics are really very different. Um, next up, I, I looked at some of the demographic information of the representatives themselves who were on the bill in this last election cycle. Um, so I started off looking at gender. Um, I thought there might be a difference um, between uh, male and female representatives in terms of who uh, is a co-sponsor of the Medicare for All bill. It turns out that there isn't, uh, There obviously you can see there's a huge gap. There's far more men who are on the bill than women, but that is because uh, there's such a huge gap in representation of women in the House of Representatives in general. Um, so the, the gender breakdown of the current co-sponsors of the Medicare for All bill compared to those who we have to organize um, in the next 118 co-sponsors are almost identical. But as I'll get to in a couple of slides from here, these averages are actually hiding uh, some interesting uh, discrepancies in terms of the, uh, the gender representation of our uh, co-sponsors and non-sponsors. So I'll, I'll revisit this in a moment. Um, but one really stark finding I found was when we looked at the race and ethnicity of the co-sponsors of Medicare for All bill. And it turns out that more than a majority, uh, uh, more than 50%, a majority of our current co-sponsors of the Medicare for All bill are people of color or identify as Hispanic, um, Latinx people. And a minority of our current co-sponsors are white. Now, uh, legislators of color, Hispanic legislators are not even close to half of the Democratic caucus, much less half of the, the House of Representatives. And you can see there's just a world of difference when you look at the next 118 co-sponsors. And again, this is looking at the last uh, uh, legislative cycle, not the current one, but I expect it will be pretty similar. Um, the race and ethnicity of uh, Democrats who are not sponsors of the Medicare for All bill, uh, uh, almost 65% of them are non-Hispanic white. And then uh, just about a third of them are, are people of color or Hispanic. Now, uh, when I said I would come back to the, the question of gender, uh, that's right here. So when I overlaid uh, gender with race, 
um, something kind of interesting and uh, in some ex in some senses inexplicable uh, stood out, which is that um, women of color who are representatives were far, far more likely than any other color category of, of, of legislators to be uh, Medicare for all co-sponsors. And that's within every each ra racial and ethnic group. So among uh, black and African-American uh, representatives, you can see that 68% of the female black female reps were on board the Medicare for all bill compared to 57% of male black African-American reps. And it's similar within uh, Hispanic representatives and Asian Pacific Islander rep representatives. Um, really women of color are leading our movement within the house um, and uh, men of color are trailing behind. So uh, you, might, uh, you might wonder at that point, how is it possible that there was not a, a huge difference between men and women in general? Well, it turns out that our, our lowest amount of support of any category is among uh, white women who are representatives in the house, only 34% of white female Democrats are on board the Medicare for All bill, whereas almost 50% of male Democrats uh, in the House are on board the bill. I have no idea what that means, and I'm not sure that it it makes a huge difference in our uh, organizing in these districts. Um, but what I also looked at, which is probably far more important, was the demographics of the districts that these folks represent. Um, and when you look at race and ethnicity, it looks actually very, very similar to looking at the reps themselves. So again, more than 50% of the districts whose legislators are on board the Medicare for All bill are co-sponsors, uh, are majority uh, people of color districts, majority Hispanic districts. Um, but when you look at the next 118 districts, these are the Democratic districts where we do not have a rep on board the bill. This is even more stark uh, than when you look at the race and ethnicity of the legislators, uh, basically 75%, three fourths of these districts are majority white. Um, and only a fourth of the remaining, those remaining districts are majority Hispanic people of color. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this again, because when we start looking at some of the other um, uh, information about the districts that we need to organize, that we need to be doing uh, where we need to win and uh, build more power and be able to, um, get these Democrats on board. Um, there is a, a huge, there's a big difference between these 75% that is majority white and the one the one quarter that's majority people of color and Hispanic. So just put a big bookmark in that for now. Um, moving on to uh, income data, um, this was also interesting. Um, on average, again, uh, the incomes were, the districts where we have a Medicare for all co-sponsor are much lower income than the districts where we where we need to organize where we do not have a co-sponsor on board the bill, um, and you can see uh, it's a difference of about you know five six thousand dollars per year uh, median income, and that's actually a huge huge number. I know the bars don't look that different when you put them side by side, but in the scheme of income of income in the, in the country and uh, especially median income where you're averaging across these whole districts, that's a huge, huge gap. Um, but once you look at, when you break them out by race, you can see that there's a, a, an interesting difference here, which is that for, um, for majority white districts, uh, those where we have, have a co-sponsor are lower income than those where we do not. Um, those where we have Democrats who are not on the bill, um, there's a much, much higher income level. But when you look at the majority Hispanic and people of color districts, it's actually the opposite, it's flipped. Um, that in, in, in the districts where we have a rep on board the bill, there's higher income than the majority uh, POC districts where we do not have uh, a rep on board the bill. And this is starting to paint a picture of, um, of the remaining districts we have to organize. There's really a different, um, uh, totally different demographics across uh, for these majority people of color districts compared to the majority white districts that we have left over to organize. Um, and uh, just to uh, illustrate this, uh, uh, how drastic this is, um, and uh, you know, the, the previous slide also showed you just the massive income gap in these majority people of color districts and the majority white districts. Of the remaining districts that we, that we do not have a co-sponsor in the bill, the 87 of them that are majority white, you can see that you know more than 80% of them have above average income in the country. Um, and uh, you know, 
almost all of them fall in the top three fourths of income. And it's the opposite in these remaining districts where we don't have a co-sponsor, but are majority people of color. There's 31 districts that fall under that category. Uh, almost none of them are in the top half of, of income. Um, I think actually Nancy, uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi's district is one of those that's a high income majority people of color district, but there's very few of those. Um, you can see that you know uh, the vast majority fall into the bottom half and even the bottom quartile of, of income earning districts in the country. Um, and this is also just to show you uh, which states have these districts that are majority people of color, but tend to be lower income um, in the same, I, I haven't put up the education uh, data here, but the education info, uh, data generally reflects the income data. Um, a ton of them are in uh, Southern California and in Florida and in Texas. Um, and then we have one in Alabama, two in Georgia, one in Hawaii, Louisiana, Maryland, North Carolina, New Jersey, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina. So uh, disproportionately in the Southern part of the country. Um, now, uh, I, did, I looked at a couple of things in the Senate side. Um, it, it doesn't really make sense to do the in-depth uh, demographic analysis of the Senate, uh, just because states are so big that when you look at the averages over states, um, it, it just hides too much, to be honest. Um, but this is the geographic spread of where the current uh, 15 Senate co-sponsors are this past um, legislative session. And again, you can see it's even a bigger gap. We have zero senators in the entire southeastern part of the country uh, from the Rocky Mountains or from the Plains states. Um, so that's an obvious shortcoming. Um, and vastly, uh, our Senate support is coming from New England and from the western part of the country, um, with some with some help also from the the southwestern part of the country and from this Middle Eastern part. Um, and this is the next 32 uh, Senate co-sponsors that we need to get on board. This is looking at, you know, the Democratic co-sponsors uh, senators or the independent senators who we need to win over the swing uh, states where we really need to get uh, them on board to hit 51 votes to pass the bill in the Senate. And you can see um, uh, that still there, there's just a ton of work that has to be done, especially in that uh, in New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, um, tons of work remaining in the Western part um, and in the Southeastern part of the country as well. Here also, I would highlight that we need to, we have a lot of work to do in the Great Lakes uh, region. Um, the last thing I'll look at, uh, I'll, I'll sort of share with you is, um, and this was eye-opening to me, how different the racial and ethnic uh, makeup of senators who are on board the bill and who are not on board the bill is from the House. You know, we saw in the House that um, our half of Democrats who we have who are basically on board the Medicare for All bill, which is an unprecedented level of support in our country. And um, I know a lot of you who are listening to this did a lot of the organizing to get us there. Um, but really that bill is being held up by uh, people of color in the house and by districts of color in the country. Um, and you'll see that that is not the case in the Senate. And that is because, surprise, the Senate is basically a racist institution. Um, it gives, you know, uh, two senators to every state, regardless of the number, the size of the population. And communities of color are overwhelmingly concentrated in large uh, states that are underrepresented in the Senate. Um, there's all these small states that tend to be, uh, uh, have a large white population that dominate in the Senate. So we don't have the benefit in the Senate side that we do on the House of having districts of color and uh, legislators of color uh, holding up our bill and advancing our bill. Um, and that's why the picture looks so much more grim on the Senate side. Um, you can see that 20% of, of senators who are co-sponsors of the Medicare for All bill are Hispanic or people of color. You know, obviously uh, Kamala Harris is, is uh, a very large chunk of that 20% uh, and she's gonna be moving on to the vice presidency. So this is already gonna look different next year. And then uh, again, very stark picture of the next 32 uh, Senate co-sponsors we need to get on the bill. Uh, again, this is looking at just the uh, last year's Senate uh, makeup. It's gonna be different this coming session with uh, those two Georgia senators coming in. Um, 10% are Hispanic people of color, uh, over 90% are non-Hispanic white identifying. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, I guess I'll close by saying a couple things, takeaways that I think should not be takeaways from this. Um, 
because it is the case that overall, when you look at the districts we have uh, have a co-sponsor versus those we do not, um, the districts we really need to be turning our attention to next, they are you know higher income districts in general, except for those majority people of color districts. They tend to be more white uh, on average than the districts where we have currently Medicare for all co-sponsors. They tend to be more Republican, more independent. These are more heavily contested districts in general. Um, they tend to be concentrated in the West Coast, in the Southeast part of the country, and in the Middle East, Eastern part of the country. Um, but I don't think that the takeaway from that is, you know, we have to change our focus to organizing rich white people around the country. Um, this may be obvious. Um, probably many of you live in these districts and you know that half of them has been gerrymandered to hell. Um, so you're, a lot of these districts are gonna have, you know, large communities of color, large urban areas, large white working class communities that have been gerrymandered into, you know, more affluent suburbs. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we're, we are gonna win this by organizing people who have been affected by the healthcare system, who have been affected by, you know, have their loved ones, um, family members that, the, that their family themselves have been touched by the healthcare system. Uh, that doesn't have to be something catastrophic. Um, it doesn't have to be uninsured necessarily, but we're facing, you know, health insecurity. And so that is not gonna be the wealthiest uh, parts of any community. But um, I think it is important to note that the political dynamics in these districts that are, you know, swing districts that have uh, higher income populations in them that make up a larger chunk of the population, um, that have uh, whiter, more suburban um, uh, 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 populations in the districts, that representatives are going to hear more from those districts than they would in the districts where we have already got a Medicare for All co-sponsor on board. The dynamics are really different there. And I think the, the, the coalition that makes up our movement right now of grassroots organizations and unions is not always uh, uh, as experienced or oriented towards organizing those types of districts. Um, and I think the groups who are experienced in those districts, we're gonna have to lean on them more heavily. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. Um, this was kind of a high level thing, obviously to get a real takeaways that are useful for organizing, you have to do a deep dive in any particular district. Um, to know what's the coalition you have to build uh, to win there, who do you have to bring to the table, which organizations really have to be uh, involved for us to win over a particular legislator. So this is not a, a how-to thing, uh, but it was really just designed to paint a broad picture of um, the first half of this marathon that we've run successfully, um, which I'm incredibly proud of, and we all should be, um, is is going to have looked a little bit different than the next half of the marathon that we're going to have to run. Um, or it could be a sprint because that's how social movements work, right? You never know when you're running a marathon or when you've reached the final part of the marathon, which is a sprint. Um, uh, you know, social movements move very slowly until they move very, very quickly. So I, I'm not putting a timeline on this or anything, but uh, regardless of how fast it happens, the type of organizing we type to do and the, the political settings in which we're gonna be organizing is gonna be looking a little bit different going forward. So I hope that's one of the things we can talk about in the conference and I'm looking forward to talking to you all about it.